Hi, so in this video, I wanted to talk about unstained controls, how to organize them within the SpectraFlow software, because depending on how complicated your experiment is, this can get super confusing. Now, before we move over to SpectraFlow, I just want to make sure we are all clear on what exactly the unstained controls are used for. There's two features in the SpectraFlow software. First is the universal negative. Second is the autofluorescence extraction. These both come up while you are doing the unmixing wizard. Now, the reason why you might want to utilize the universal negative is the negative gate that you are setting on your reference control is maybe not optimal for that control. And so instead of using the data that's within that gate, which you can call an internal negative, uh, we can instead direct the software to utilize a unstained tube that matches that control. So I have two examples here. Um, the CD14 is staining monocytes, and you can see that the internal negative for this tube is granulocytes and lymphocytes. So if we drew a gate on the negative, it would take the autofluorescence signature of these two subsets. However, following the rules of high quality reference controls, we need to make sure that the positive population and negative population have matching autofluorescence properties. So in this situation, the way to get the best unmixing results would be to tell the software to instead use an unstained tube and then gate on the unstained monocytes and use that as the universal negative for this particular CD14 control. Another example is CD45 here, where pretty much all of our cells in the sample express the marker and we don't really have much of a negative population. Uh, in this case, maybe the software would give us an error message and say we don't have enough events in the negative gate. Um, or I don't know if the autofluorescent properties match between these two populations. So in this situation, I would always also use the universal negative. For autofluorescence extraction, um, this feature is useful sometimes when you have really high complex autofluorescence, like this lower example. This is an unstained tissue digest. This is really on the extreme side of things. Um, most samples are probably not going to look like this. <laughs> um, but this has multiple autofluorescent signatures in it, whereas this top one has a single autofluorescent signature that's relatively low. Um, this is probably PBMCs, I think. So in this case, if you want to use the autofluorescence extraction feature, it will take the signature of the autofluorescence from your unstained tube, and it will use that signature. It will kind of turn it into its own floor four channel, but it's not really a floor four. So you're going to call it, uh, the software calls it a AF channel, uh, and that could potentially improve your data. So if we want to use these two features, there is something that is important for you to know, uh, which is you have to bring an unstained control for every tissue in your experiment. Sometimes for people forget to bring one for every tissue and they just bring one unstained control. If you're using multiple tissues in your experiment, maybe you're using one for the controls, one for the samples, um, or however you have it set up, every single tissue that you bring in your experiment needs to have a matching unstained control. Uh, another thing is when you run these unstained controls, we also need to make sure that you have enough events recorded. So if you're just recording 10,000 events, it's probably not going to be enough to utilize these features properly. You're going to likely need more events recorded. I can't give you an exact number on that. It really depends on the tissue. So you might have to play around with that a little bit, but definitely plan on recording more. So I'm going to switch over to SpectraFlow in a second to talk about uh, how to set up the universal negatives. But if you have these two types of experiments, then you would probably want to set up the universal negatives in the way that I'm about to show you. The, so the first one is maybe you just have a single tissue. Um, so you have the same tissue for controls and fully stained samples. But within that tissue or within that panel, actually, uh, you have markers that are on lymphocytes, markers on monocytes, markers on granulocytes. That's one example. Second example is maybe you have multiple tissue types. Maybe you've 
done some optimization and determined that you can use spleen for some of your reference controls and lung tissue for other reference controls. And then you have lung tissue digest for your fully stained samples. And you also want to utilize the universal negatives, but sometimes you need the universal negative from your spleen tissue and sometimes you need it from your lung tissue. So I'm going to switch over to SpectroFlow and show you how to set up the universal negatives. Uh, that is going to be underneath the modify experiment or the edit button. Then we're going to go to the groups tab and we can see all of our tubes here, but in order to edit the reference group, we've got to modify that with this button up here. And the universal negatives are basically this last column here, which is called negative control. So at the moment, I have a single option because I only have recorded one unstained tube. And if I want more options, then I need to check this box, define additional negative controls for spillover calculation, and this will allow me to generate additional unstained tubes. So you can label them however you want. You also have the option to have beads and cells. So if you wanted to run unstained beads because you had some problems with your negative bead controls, you could add that in. Um, here, I'm gonna change this to unstained lymphocytes and monocytes. And now I have more options for my negative control. So let's say my Fitzy is maybe it's C3, so it's only on lymphocytes. So I'm gonna se select lymphocytes. Uh, you, if you change the control for the first tube, it's gonna automatically apply that to the remaining tubes, but you can always change those individually. So maybe APC is my CD14, so that one's only on monocytes. And let's say my last floor, the internal negative is appropriate, so we'll just leave that blank. Now that we've set this up, we have two additional tubes to record. Now there's a few different ways you can fill up these tubes, essentially. Um, if you're sitting at the cytometer, you can just record the same tube multiple times. So you're only gonna bring maybe one tube or maybe you have multiple tissues so you have multiple unstained tubes. But if you have the same tissue type and you just want a different gate on the same control, then we can just record the tube three times. If you don't wanna do that or if you are not at the cytometer at the moment, like me, uh, you can also import those files. So if I right click import FCS file, I'm just gonna import the file that I already recorded. So I'm gonna do that twice. So now for all three of these unstained tubes, I have the exact same FCS file assigned. Now when I go to unmix this, and we look at our options for our controls, you'll see that we now have three tubes that are unstained and we need to set gates on all three of these tubes. Now, the first gate unstained, the default one, just unstained cells. The way I currently have my experiment set up and because I'm not using the autofluorescence extraction feature, this gate doesn't have a purpose but if you're using the autofluorescence extraction feature, you'd wanna set this gate on your highest autofluorescence signature. Then I have my unstained lymphocytes tube, so I wanna make sure that's on lymphocytes and then unstained monocytes. So I'm gonna put that one on the monocyte population. So it's the same file, but I just have a different gate. And overall, when you're unmixing, it's better to draw a gate on a single population or a smaller gate as opposed to just drawing a huge gate around all of your cells. Your unmixing won't be quite so successful. So we're just gonna keep that just on the monocytes and just on the lymphocytes. So that is your first option. The other way to set things up is to actually generate new files. So if we look at, here's my unstained cells file. Uh, I can put the gate around the monocytes. Uh, 
I right click this and then select export gated events as an FCS file. Then I can type in a file name. You can see I've already created unstained monocytes. So save that wherever you want. And then I can move this gate down to my lymphocyte population, right click, same, uh, select the same thing, export gated events as an FCS file and generate two brand new FCS files. Then I'm going to have to import those in. So again, it's right click import FCS file, import in the lymphocytes and the monocytes files. So now when I look at these tubes, you can see we just have one subset of cells in the FCS file and nothing else. Now when I unmix, it honestly doesn't matter quite so much where I set the gates because we've sort of pre-gated them, but you definitely want to make sure that your gate is still on your cells of interest. So that is the second way. Now for the autofluorescence extraction, you typically need to do these extra steps that I'm showing you if you have situations like I've outlined on this slide. So in example three, we have different tissues. Um, so maybe we have spleen for reference controls and lung tissue digest for our fully stained samples. Or in example four, maybe you've made things very large and complicated um, and you have one tissue for your reference control and two or more tissues for your fully stained samples. And again, this is the situation in which you want to utilize the autofluorescence extraction feature. If you're not using this feature, then you don't have to worry about setting up spectral flow this way. So to set up the additional tubes for autofluorescence extraction, that's again gonna be under the edit button to modify the experiment. Go to the, we're going to go to the groups tab again and again we only have one tube at the moment that can be used for autofluorescence extraction it is this default unstained tube and the reason why i know this is because if you click the reference group you can see at the very top here it says define unstained controls for autofluorescence extraction so this tube by default is the one that it uses for that feature. If you have a fairly simple experiment where you just have one tissue for your reference controls and a second tissue for your fully stained samples, I guess in theory you could run your whatever tissue you've used for your fully stained samples under this specific unstained tube. And then when you go to do the autofluorescence extraction, your fully stained tubes will be correct. But what I've actually found is, depending on how complicated your autofluorescence is, it's also going to try to pull that signature out of your reference group tubes, so it might be a little bit hard to assess your autofluorescence in that way. So what I would recommend doing is using the group-specific unstained controls. And to get those, you're going to select a group you're going to right click it and then you can choose unstained control. So now we have a second unstained control that is only for this specific group of tubes. So if I had additional tubes, um, then the autofluorescent signature from this unstained tube would be removed from all of the um, tubes within the same folder. However, however, if I add a new group, maybe I'll call that tissue two, it's not going to use the autofluorescence signature of this unstained tube and take it out of any of the files in this second folder. What it would actually do for the tubes in tissue two, because there's no group specific unstained control, it's then going to go back to the original option, which is your unstained cells tube up here. And it's going to pull autofluorescence from this tube for any tubes in this group, not the tubes in this group because it has a group specific unstained control. And it's probably going to use this unstained tube to extract autofluorescence from anything in your reference group. We can also add 
an unstained tube to this one. So now each tissue has its own unstained control. You'll also notice that we cannot unmix our data at this time, even though we've filled the reference group. That's because these are reference tubes. And we know that because there's a little R next to them. So in order to get to the unmixing, you not only need to record everything in your reference group, but also these tubes that have R's next to them. So these two unstained tubes also need to be recorded. And once you have that, then you can unmix your data set. Now for the super complicated experiment, when you have more than one tissue that's fully stained and you're trying to use the same panel and the same set of controls on multiple tissues, I would caution you against doing that. First of all, you do need to treat each tissue individually, optimize the panel on each tissue individually, make sure that the controls work for each tissue individually. Um, the most obvious risk would be if the expression of the marker on the tissue in your reference group, so maybe your reference group is spleen, and you stain marker one on spleen, and that expression level is lower than the marker one on lung, then it's not gonna be a good control for lung, but maybe it's a good control for blood. Um, so things can get very complicated. You might also find that you need slightly different parameters for each of your tissues. Maybe one of your tissues, you need the autofluorescence extraction and another tissue you don't. Um, or one tissue, you need some really fancy advanced um, methods for autofluorescence extraction and another tissue you don't. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you can talk to your technical application specialist if you have a SciTech Aurora or if you're at the UChicago, at UChicago, you can talk to me. Um, but you might find that you can't use exactly the same parameters to unmix every single tissue that you ran. And so what you would need to do is have multiple spectral flow experiments. The easiest way to set that up would be, I would record everything in your reference group, record the first set of tissue, um, if you're crunched for time and you don't want to deal with the complications of unmixing immediately while you're sitting there at the cytometer, you want to save that for later, you could just continue running all the rest of your samples and record everything in the same experiment. Once you have the files, you can rearrange it later on. Um, so it depend, it's up to you how you want to set it up while you're actually sitting at the cytometer. Um, but for unmixing, I would do the unmixing and make sure it's appropriate for your first tissue. Once you have everything done for your first tissue um, and you've gone through the unmixing wizard and set all the P1 and the positive and the negative gates on your reference controls and hit live unmixing, when you're done with that, you can close that experiment with this X button here. And we can go back to my experiments. We can select the experiment that we just closed, right click it, duplicate it, and then open up that copy. And then in this copied experiment, you can deal with your second tissue. And the reason why I have you unmix first and then copy the experiment is because by doing it in that order, this should now maintain all of those gates that you set up in the unmixing wizard. So you shouldn't have to redo the P1 and the positive and the negative gates all over again. Um, you can just, you know, make your minor modifications that you need to do so it's appropriate for your second data set and then click live unmixing again and everything should work out for your second set of tissue. And I think that is everything. Hopefully that helps clear things up.